Erin Kennedy here today with Evan New. We're doing Tech Teardown for Tuesday, April 8th. On Monday, Qualcomm announced its latest addition to its Snapdragon processor family. This time around, the company is making an important strategic departure. What's the story here? So Qualcomm announced the new Snapdragon 808 and 810, uh, which will effectively complete Qualcomm's 64-bit Snapdragon lineup, what they've been starting to build out over the past few months. Uh, but the big difference this time around is that they're using, this is the first time that Qualcomm is using ARM's big little design implementation, which is where you pair low power cores with high power cores. Uh, for example, the A10 has four Cortex-A57s matched with four Cortex-A53s. But this is all really interesting to me because Qualcomm has been probably the biggest opponent to this whole idea of jamming in as many cores as you can. Uh, which you know rivals have been doing for quite some time, and they've always always argued that you know more powerful cores, but a fewer number of them, is a better way to approach this, which has really more or less been their whole you know product and marketing strategy for for as long as I can remember with their custom designed crate cores. So then, why is Qualcomm doing an about face on this? What's driving this? Apple. Apple. In a word, Apple. Uh, you know, on the consumer level, I mean, Apple, you know, last year when they launched the iPhone Pi Best with the 64-bit A7, it was kind of a marketing thing for on the consumer level because most consumers probably don't really know on the technical level what that means for them beyond just better performance or whatever. Right. It uh, sounds more impressive, I guess. Right. And I mean, it's something you'll just notice when the phone's fast, but you're not going to look behind the scenes necessarily all the time if you're just an average consumer. But the reality is that the A7 really caught the entire industry off guard, like everyone just kind of freaked out because they were like, how do they have this thing ready and no one knew about it? Because uh, you know, the move to a 64-bit architecture is actually pretty meaningful in, in terms of long-term implications. So I mean, Apple's biggest chip rivals are Qualcomm and Samsung, uh, and both have been kind of like scrambling to try and put together some 64-bit strategy. And this is basically a response to Apple by Qualcomm. Oh, absolutely. I mean, so you know, over the, one, the 64-bit ones that Qualcomm has been doing have all been these kind of more standard ARM cores as opposed to their custom cores that they've been, they would prefer to use, but custom cores take a really long time to implement and design, and, and you know, so it's not really realistic to come out with that six months after the fact. Whereas you can take the standard parts and conceivably do that. Well, and, so you, you mentioned Samsung too. What's what's Samsung's response been? Has there been a response yet? So Samsung immediately, you know, back last year, immediately said, "Oh, we're going to do 64-bit chip also," but. Again, that's easier said than done because you know it's going to take a long time to develop that. So I mean, the, for example, the, the newest Galaxy S5, which is going to be the flagship big seller this year, still uses 32-bit chips, um, both powered by their own Exynos or you know, you know Snapdragons. But either way, I mean, it's still going to be a little while until they can come out with one, and they. You know, they haven't really announced a specific timing around this, but I think Apple has about a one-year lead on its rivals in this case, so it'll be very interesting, interesting to see what happens when they, what they release later this year, when just at the time when Apple or when Qualcomm and Samsung are coming out with kind of getting closer to their own 64-bit designs, Apple might just jump forward yet again. Shares of Nokia are enjoying healthy gains today after the company announced that China has approved its proposed sale of its devices business to Microsoft. This is big news, isn't it? The shares are up pretty nicely, so I think people are, are relieved to hear it. So the, the deal is supposed to close in the first quarter, but last month Nokia and Microsoft said that this would be delayed by a little bit because Asian regulators are still kind of scrutinizing the deal. So I don't think there was a lot of, of concern that the deal would fall together all, all you know, fall apart, but I think that technically added a little bit of uncertainty. Do you think this reaction by shares or by investors, do you think this is an overreaction? I mean, I think that people are just, anytime you take uncertainty out of the equation, people, people, are, gonna, people are gonna respond positively. Um, so I think that's kind of the, the key here. Uh, uh, Chinese regulators have agreed to the deal, but there's some conditions that they're imposing on Microsoft in terms of licensing and making sure that they're going to have uh, some of their local Chinese smartphone makers, most of which use Android, that Microsoft will t not be overly, you know, will still have good deals for some of the patent licensing, um, you know, because they don't want their own companies to kind of inevitably get somehow get hurt by this deal. Um, so it's still expected to close this month, and Nokia did note that no regulator has questioned their own standards essential patent licensing you know, practices, so that's also some, you know, some good news for them too. Well, so Microsoft's weak position in the mobile market has led to some pretty dramatic moves, including this Nokia deal. Do you have, do you, is there anything else Microsoft has up its sleeve? So one of the other big things that they just recently announced was last week at their Build Developer Conference, they did confirm kind of some previous rumors that Windows Phone is going to a zero licensing fee, which is a pretty big deal because that's exactly what Android does. Uh, one big difference is that Android is open source, Windows Phone is not open source, so OEMs can't go in here and modify what, you know, the platform uh, and tailor it like you know, people do in Android, but there'll be pricing parity in terms of the zero you know, price point for OEMs. And I, mean, I think that's kind of 
you kind of need to do that when you're buying your biggest manufacturer because obviously you can't charge yourself right. money and to get other people to join in. Do you like that move though or do you think this is kind of an admission of failure on Microsoft's part? Like, well now we got to give it away because no one's going to pay for it. No one's it. buying it. <laughs> no, I think it's just kind of one of those like desperate times call for desperate measures. So, I mean, and, and they also have reportedly uh, inked new deals with some Indian manufacturers like Lava and Micromax and this cutting this fee to zero has reportedly been a key way that they've been able to get that because otherwise, you know, you, Microsoft really needs OEM support to, to really make Windows Phone a viable third place platform. And to do that, you need to compete with your, I mean, your, your next best competitor is Android, which is free. I mean, you have to kind of get on the same playing field. Otherwise, so why would you even consider right. with such a, an outlier in essence. So I think it's definitely the right move to make. Uh, I don't think they have much of a choice, but we'll have to see if it actually works out, if they can make up for that in terms of some of the services revenue that they want to create from Bing and ads and you know, all the other stuff that they hope to push. Right. It's not easy being a wireless carrier. and regional carrier, Cincinnati Bell is effectively throwing in the towel. The end result is that the strong gets stronger with top dog Verizon buying up Cincinnati Bell's wireless assets. This is a really interesting story. More consolidation, I guess. What's going on? Yeah, so Cincinnati Bell is the ninth largest wireless carrier right now. But they've been struggling for about five or six years, and this sale has been a long time coming. Uh, last February, they you know, said that they're reviewing strategic alternatives for the wireless business, which is just a nice way of saying we're trying to sell it. Right. And which, you know, just code speak for code everyone, speak. everyone knows what you're talking about. But, uh, so Verizon is paying upwards of $210 million now to buy you know, wireless assets, most of which will be Spectrum, mm -hmm. uh, but also including, uh, they'll also take over some of the tower lease obligations. Uh, and you know, the Cincinnati Bell CEO thinks that this is really the perfect time to make this deal because you know, with all the stuff that's been happening in the wireless industry, this is when they probably, probably get the maximum value for selling off some of these assets. And instead, you know, they're going to also encourage their wireless customers tra to transition to Verizon, but they don't have to. But you know, uh, it's probably a safe bet that the majority of them will. Uh, instead, Cincinnati Bell will be focusing on its data center business, which it operates mainly through its majority-owned subsidiary, Cyrus One. So this sounds, this is obviously a good deal for Ryzen, because, you know, more Spectrum. That's not a bad thing. Yeah, so I think Spectrum is really the, the main you know, key benefit for Verizon here, because like you said, I mean, carriers just always want more Spectrum. So does this mean, a, is it a loss for Cincinnati Bell? Well, I mean, they're, they're pretty much getting out of the business, so you want to get something back, you know, basically sell out, sell off these assets. The customer side of it isn't going to be too meaningful, like not going to be a needle mover for Verizon. So Cincinnati Bell had about 340,000 subscribers, yeah, that's which, which really was on the decline because they're just losing customers to Verizon anyways. But yeah, I mean, when you already have 100 million subscribers, yeah. that's that's not going to be the, uh, the meaningful thing here. But yeah, like you said, the stronger just getting stronger here, which you know, puts even more pressure on these kind of smaller regional carriers as if there wasn't enough already. Yeah, that's the thing is, do they even have a chance here? Can I, like, Verizon won this bidding war, clearly. If there was one, Verizon stepped up and paid that big price tag. Can regional carriers even really compete anymore? It's, it's just such a really tough, you know, industry for smaller players to come up. Uh, just from a structural standpoint, too, I mean, it's so capital intensive that you need to have deep pockets you know, for so many reasons. I mean, if, if you look at Spectrums, FCC auctions, you know, it goes to the highest bidder, which mm -hmm. inevitably favors the bigger people that right. have more money. You know, so I mean, they have another uh, auction coming up in 2015, um, and but the smaller carriers have been lobbying for you know, the FCC to structure rules to kind of skew it more in their favor to give them a better chance because, you know, it's just really hard to compete with the guys. I don't think they have so much more money to actually buy the spectrum, but then also to actually build the networks mm -hmm. from the infrastructure standpoint. So it's just so hard for, you know, and, and with them getting even bigger and more powerful, and it, it's extremely tough. So, I mean, I wouldn't be betting on any regional carriers anytime soon. Uh, and there have also been examples of big carriers that have, you know, bought up Spectrum assets or had Spectrum assets, and they're not fully utilizing them as they a way don't to, have to right. I mean, as a way to kind of preclude competition right. anyway. So, I mean, they have a lot of levers they can pull and put a lot of pressure on these small guys. Let's turn to all about Apple. Apple has made a lot of progress with its custom A chip designs over the past couple of years. Now the Mac maker may be looking to broaden its chip expertise. What chip are we talking about? So there's a new report um, out of Digitimes, our favorite Digitimes. You know, rumor monger. So trusty. <laughs> saying that Apple is starting a new R&D team to build baseband processors, uh, likely for the 2015 iPhone models. And the baseband processors, you know, the one that handles all the radio functions, most importantly the cellular uh, connectivity. And it's, it's probably one of the most important 
components of a smartphone nowadays in general. Uh, and Apple is reportedly going to tap Samsung and Global Foundries for manufacturing services. Uh, and there's also this other side kind of note that Apple might be interested in integrating cellular basebands into its processor, which is actually a broader trend that's been taking place in the industry for a really long time. And I'm, actually, I'm actually surprised that Apple has yet to do this move. Um, but it's a little bit unclear. And, and right now, I think the, the thinking is that they're more likely going to keep using discrete chips. Well, so uh, the iPhone's been around since 2007. Why has it taken Apple so long to pursue this kind of cellular integration? Uh, so I've been kind of wondering, like, you know, this has been happening in this industry for so long. Yeah, that, why now? Like, and, and I mean, you get a lot of, one of the biggest benefits for integration is the much better power efficiency. You get much better battery life. And Apple's already been kind of, uh, you know, at the top of the industry with its battery life and as far as its mobile phones go. But I think one of the things is they probably focused their development efforts on you know, designing their custom CPU architecture, which took, I mean, about five years to actually get, you know, they, they've been making acquisitions for years, so it takes a long time, and I think that's much more important and, and a much more valuable differentiator. Um, and also, you know, probably a little bit less tricky. I mean, there have been a lot of people that have, you know, tried to get on baseband's, and it, it's, it's not that easy of a thing to, to actually develop. So if Apple's now taking this in-house, who loses here? Who, who's not going to be supplying Apple anymore? So their, their current uh, baseband supplier is Qualcomm, and they've been exclusively supplying these baseband to Apple for years. Uh, it's definitely negative, but it's kind of hard to quantify the exact impact that they might have. So I've seen estimates that Apple is about 15% of Qualcomm's revenue. That's but, pretty meaningful. But a lot of that is their licensing business. You know, since anytime you make a phone, you got to pay a Qualcomm license right. just for making the phone. Um, so you know, how much of that is baseband revenue? It's kind of hard to to tell. Uh, and you know, further down the line of how much profit are they actually making from these basebands. So, I mean, Apple is definitely the biggest OEM that still goes out there and buys discrete basebands. So, I mean, it, it could take a chunk out of that market. I mean, right now the total baseband market is estimated about 16 to 19 billion dollars, and Qualcomm has about 50 percent market share here. Uh, Taiwan Semiconductor is Qualcomm's manufacturing partner, so they could also be you know, more further downstream and you see some losses too. Uh, but again, it's kind of hard to say exactly how much. Well, so you mentioned this story appeared in Digitimes. <laughs> and we all know Digitimes track record with, you know, truth, this that accuracy, sort of thing. Right? Accuracy, facts. So how likely do you think this is accurate? I think that it makes a lot of sense from a strategic level on why Apple would want to do this. But the reality is, you know, like we've been talking about, it's, it's much easier said than done. Like, like, for example, Qualcomm's rivals have all been spending billions and billions of dollars a year for many years to try to catch up with some of the cellular technology, like Broadcom and MediaTek, and they're not there yet. So if we have these other players that are dedicated in already and they're still having trouble... Yeah, Apple's not the expert. So. Right, I mean, this isn't an area where Apple has you know, expertise, whereas they, we, we, before they did their own chips, they were buying chip companies so you could actually, you know, their CPU companies, so you had an idea. But they have, to our knowledge, they haven't acquired any, like, wireless division. I mean, there's been talk that maybe they should uh, you know, acquire Intel's wireless division or Broadcom's wireless division to actually get the underlying foundation for this. But to our knowledge, Apple doesn't have a lot of expertise here. So I, I don't know how realistic it is, uh, especially when it took them five years to transition to custom CPU. So, so are I, you thinking grain of salt on this story? Uh, absolutely. Boulder of salt, <laughs> yeah, maybe? Maybe more than a grain. All right. Investors are already widely expecting Apple to launch a larger iPhone 6 this year. We're now seeing some direct evidence to that effect. We can actually thank Samsung for this one. Oh, really? <laughs> so as part of this, the, the, the second round of their you know, patent trial, you know, they, you know, they like to fight a lot in court, but some of the internal documents that are being presented as part of evidence in this case includes this exhibit from a fiscal year 2014 planning slideshow that Apple put together uh, about a year ago. So this was you know, you know, as of 2013, early 2013. But in it, they, they you know, take note of the dramatically decelerating iPhone unit sales growth, which everyone is widely Everyone's aware of. Right right right. So I'm not surprised that Apple knows it's happening, too. Uh, but they also very directly and pointedly acknowledge some of these competitive concerns that investors have been talking about, like very specifically consumers demanding bigger and cheaper phones. Uh, carriers are kind of wary of the iPhone because it has such a the high subsidies. share. The subsidies are high. They're, the interests aren't perfectly aligned. Uh, and they just don't have as much control. But also that competitors are catching up on the ecosystem front. They're spending obscene amounts on marketing, which is an obvious reference to Samsung. Of course. Uh, and right. they, they very explicitly say consumers don't want what we don't, or consumers want what we don't have, which is kind of a pretty uh, 
That's a pretty frank admission. Pretty explicit there. <laughs> so it seems like Apple is finally acknowledging that the broader market is heading towards bigger and cheaper. I think so that's the... They have to respond to that? Is that what's happening here? I think that's you know more or less what they're getting at. I mean, they noted that in 2011 to 2012, the smartphone market grew by about 228 million units to 720-ish million. And their estimates are that 250 million of those units were under $300 and or over 4 inch displays which is the Mac, you know the iPhone 5 is 4 inch right now. So and that's that those two segments are accounting for more than the overall growth in the smartphone market and that's where the growth is and So Apple's got to pursue that. I mean investors want growth and of course Apple wants to maintain its very healthy business. So inevitably you have to kind of respond. Well, I don't we always bring up Steve Jobs even though like how irrelevant he is now is kind of questionable but Apple has always been known for like not following market forecasts, forecasts and not focusing on what focus groups have to say Steve Jobs had some quote like you know you don't give the consumer what they want you tell them what they want right I mean he, he always good at telling people what they want and, yeah and I mean he's a marketing genius <laughs> but you know do you think that's changing that sort of ethos of like we know we know best I think that that thinking definitely applies when you're creating new markets and new product categories because people don't know what they don't know, like they don't right. know what, it, what you're gonna make. Did so you want an iPhone before you do it exist? <laughs> right. I mean, like, and yeah. he likes to plug the old Ford quote of like, you know, if you ask people what they want, they would have said a faster horse, post like a car, and you know, one of his right. quotes. But you know, again, I think that's in the context of creating new markets, and which Apple is certainly very good at. But right now, with the smartphone market, we're no longer talking about a new market, and we're talking about an existing market and shifting preferences within an existing market. In which case, you know, even though Apple's never really used focus groups or things like that to gauge, you still have to kind of accommodate what consumers are telling you and what consumers are voting for with their wallets. So I think there is kind of a, a little bit of a you know, contrast between how in Apple probably works internally relative to, you know, versus its public perception. So I, I'm sure they do a lot of internal forecasting. Um, so, I mean, this makes sense, but uh, I, I think it is about time to, to kind of come out with the bigger iPhone because I think that's what people are wanting. And there's been a lot of, I mean, invest, every time you talk about this bigger iPhone 6, shares go up. So investors are definitely excited so you, also. So investors like this idea. And they're already kind of expecting. So at this point, Right. If you're expecting it and you disappoint them, it's not going to be good for the stock price. That's all for today on Tech Teardown. For Evan New, I'm Aaron Kennedy, and we'll see you next time.